Before we start today's show, we want to invite you to stick around at the end of the episode to enjoy a preview of a new podcast that premieres on July 14th. As the industry's exclusive cannabis podcast network, MJ Bulls is proud to present Women Leading in Cannabis. Join host Kira Reed each week for inspirational discussions with women who are leading the cannabis industry. Welcome to another episode of Hemp Barons. On today's show, we have someone whose passion for the plant was ignited when she was just a child, which partially explains how this hemp baron has accomplished so much at such a young age. In addition to running a successful hemp for profit business, she also founded and runs a successful hemp not for profit. And in her spare time, she studies hemp history and produces a historical hemp podcast. Let's join Joy's conversation with Annie Rouse. It's always so fantastic to speak with you. You were, unlike so many folks who are just finding themselves in this new emerging space of hemp, you were born into the hemp movement and the hemp industries in Kentucky. Can you tell us a little bit about your unique family history? Yeah, for sure. I was introduced to hemp when I was at a ripe age of eight years old because my dad actually did videography in Kentucky and he filmed Woody Harrelson's grand arrest down in Kentucky when he planted four hemp seeds to try to purposefully get arrested and get the ticket to the Supreme Court to get him distinguished between marijuana on the Controlled Substances Act. So I was eight when that happened. It was shining in my eyes. It was introduced me to hemp initially and made me really curious about the plant. And because of that, my parents always talked about it in the household. So it wasn't like they thought it was like this crazy drug, like a lot of people did. Instead, they always were very passionate about the fact that Kentucky needed to make it legal again and the United States need to make it legal again. And that really was the impetus for me to continue to investigate it further, particularly when I was in college. And I ended up writing a paper about it and scouring through the William T. Young Library at the University of Kentucky that has a fantastic collection, actually, of the history of hemp in Kentucky. And that really set the future of my career into motion in terms of understanding the plant, really sparking a fire underneath me and trying to do everything possible to help hemp overcome the stigma that it has and try to make it legal in Kentucky and in the United States once again. And I think folks don't know, my, my youngest son uh, w- also went to University of Kentucky, and I think folks don't realize that that library, I think, is something like the third largest university library in the country. It's very impressive. And of course, Kentucky... Yeah, it's actually the second largest behind Harvard. Uh, the second largest. Oh, behind Harvard. Thank, I can't believe I skewed that statistic. And thank you, man. Yeah, it's <laughs> very, very impressive. And obviously, Kentucky has a, a huge history in the hemp industries. And that is why, of course, back in the 90s, your dad and then I know the Hickey brothers and some others, of course, along with Woody Harrelson, you know, really were uh, very instrumental in the revival of the movement there through political actions and acts of civil disobedience, just like you just described. Woody Harrelson coordinating with your dad and others the intentional act of, of disobedience, of planting those Schedule one controlled substance hemp seeds, of course, they're not anymore and and getting arrested. And, And can you tell us a little bit about the history in Kentucky of the hemp industry? Yeah, sure. So uh, hemp was one of Kentucky's largest cash crops in the, in the mid 1800s and early 1900s. Kentucky actually in in 1900, 90% of the United States' hemp came out of Kentucky, mostly within the bluegrass area in central Kentucky, and it fed a lot of the a lot of times hemp would correlate, production would correlate with wartime efforts. And there were lots of fiber processing mills and grain processing mills throughout the state, as well as a lot of the farmers actually have read through old archives of pharmaceutical companies working with farmers who would harvest the hemp that was growing on the riverbanks of Kentucky and Ohio rivers. And they would harvest that and sell it to the pharmaceutical industry 
like uh, Eli Lilly and Bristol Myers and and Squibb and those companies and use it within their cannabis oils that were marketed, you know, prior to the Marijuana Tax Act. And then once the Marijuana Tax Act came into place, that, of course, really uh, pushed the industry underground and with the, but then when, with the rise of Hemp for Victory because of World War II, Actually, there was a, a pretty tremendous uptick in production in Kentucky and around the area. And that, um, in fact, the as part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's work to you know, reinvigorate the farmers to grow hemp, they actually purchased a big warehouse in Winchester, Kentucky. And when they went around to really try and control the seed stock for hemp, they purchased it at a farmers would say a very low rate as to what its true value was, uh, but they went around and purchased or commandeered, one farmer said, uh, the seed stock and put it all the seed stock into this warehouse in Winchester, Kentucky, and then reallocated that back out to the farmers so that they could understand exactly who was growing and how much they were growing in order to supply the Navy with you know proper rope and have enough uh, reproduction of the seeds as well for the following season. So Kentucky played a very pivotal role in uh, in those Hemp for Victory campaign and, and the World War II efforts to you know, bring hemp back into the economy for wartime efforts. So it was a very important for the state at that time. Critical role. Yes, a critical role. And for the listeners, for those out there who don't know what we're talking about when mentioning or referencing this movie, Hemp for Victory, if you haven't seen it, Please, in your next spare time, you'll only 13 and a half minutes that will change your life when you go onto youtube.com, search Hemp for Victory, and try to get the results. There's lots of them that's around 13 and a half minutes. And it's the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture's film, because the Japanese, of course, had invaded the Philippines Mm -hmm. during World War II, cutting off our supply of hemp. And so we had no choice, even though we had basically taxed and regulated hemp out of existence through the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. Five years later, 1942, we're now begging farmers to please, oh my goodness, plant more hemp because we need it for the Navy. And that's so that hemp for victory, just real life-changing stuff when you see in our government's own words and through their own produced film, the real role that hemp has played here. And certainly Kentucky is highlighted in that film. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yes, and yes. moving up to the current day, Miss Annie, you are involved in so many things. The hemp industry and the hemp movement is so blessed to have you. We serve on uh, the HIA board together. We do a lot of impo- the Hemp Industries Association board together. We do work together through the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, through Vote Hemp, through the various coalitions, and you're just such an active and valuable member. So I want to talk for a minute about your you your hemp barrenness, your commercial endeavors, which are so important and are are so successful. A Navi market that you and advocacy and hemp industry leader Jason Amatucci founded together. Can you tell us a little bit about Anavi Market and what makes Anavi different than other portals or outlets selling uh, hemp extract products? And CBD, hemp rate, yeah, CBD definitely. Product. So Anavi was really born out of the fact that I had had a health problem a couple of years ago and decided to turn to CBD knowing so much about the industry already, but really being more on the grain and fiber side, I gave CBD a try and it really helped the initial product that I tried really helped me a lot. And then I started trying other products and realized that they didn't help me as much as the initial product that I had tried and started investigating the space more and noticed that there was a large discrepancy between companies and the products that were on the market. And you see that more and more now with the FDA coming out against a couple companies and with different studies saying 70% of the CBD products on the market are mislabeled and other companies having contaminants and and things of the like within the products that aren't healthy for people who are trying to get healthy off of these products. So Jason and I met at, um, actually we had been acquainted in the industry prior, but really got to know each other at the Hemp Industries Association Conference in Lexington in 2017 and decided that we were you know very compatible as business partners. And I had already been tinkering with this idea of creating a marketplace for verified CBD products. And so we ended up partnering together to bring that 
into fruition. So Anavi Market was born in January of 2018. And Anavi stands for, it was a word that we made up, but it the definition is an alternative lifestyle. And in Sanskrit with one eye, it's actually Sanskrit for kind to people, which is really the motto that we have in that Anavi Market is kind to people uh, because we really care about the individuals that we're providing these products to. And that's why we've taken it upon ourselves to make sure that all the brands that we represent within our marketplace are fully vetted. We've gone out to the facilities. We know the companies. We've met with their scientists and their manu- and the manufacturers and the you know their business development ends and we've seen the lab tests and then we'll actually take samples and we'll send them off to to Eurofins and uh, which is a leading lab within the within the nation and really the world uh, so that we know that the products that we're providing to others are safe and legal for you know from legal hemp and that they can provide that best impact for the individual that's using it uh, just like I wanted when I very first got you know, introduced to CBD products several years ago. So we wanted to bring that to other people so that they could have a positive experience. Because if people aren't having a positive experience with these products that are new and up, com- up and coming, then they're not going to turn back to them again. And that's not good for the industry in the end. So it's all about building a sustainable industry and making sure that what we provide is safe and effective. Indeed. So what sets Anavi apart of other outlets that, that sell multiple brands of CBD is that you have carefully and, and diligently curated the products that you sell for safety, quality assurance, and obviously sourced from, from legal hemp. So when folks shop Definitely. on Anavi Market, they know that those are diligently curated products that meet very high standards for quality and consumer safety. Oh yeah, we've tried them all ourselves, making sure that they work within, you know, work for me, they work for my for Jason, they work for our employees. So, you know, we're not afraid to take them either. Um and yes, they're highly curated and then we have a lot of educational content as well, think, you know, tips to help people improve their experience with CBD. We have uh what we call our Wellness Pal, which is a product selection tool so that people can answer question, a series of questions, and then it provides recommendations based on on their desires and needs. So it is a highly curated platform and you can find it on anavimarket.com. It's A-N-A-V-I-I market.com. Let me ask you this, ma'am. Speaking of great blogs and great information, you also have your own podcast. What is the name of your podcast? It's called Anslinger, the Untold Cannabis Conspiracy. Which is uh, so brilliant. It is so brilliant. You want to tell us who Henry Anslinger is? Anslinger, the Untold Cannabis Conspiracy is a brainchild of mine. It's a combination of narration and interviews with experts at the topic at hand. So it's for the last 10 years or so, I've dug through our government archives around the United States and particularly within Harry Anslinger's archives, who was chief commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics from 1930 to 1962. So he created all the drug enforcement strategies that exist today. Obviously, cannabis is one of them, including hemp. And so the podcast really takes the uh, look at this drug prohibition within his eyes and what was he doing in that time and who was he and how did his approach to drug control impact the way that we view narcotics today and medicine today and uh, imprisonment and a whole series of things that across a wide range of spectrum that have really influenced modern America. So it's a deep dive into that. And it's nine episodes right now. They take a really long time for me to create. So because it's a lot of research and then editing and narration and interviews. So I've gotten, you know, you can find it on iTunes and Google Play and and Spotify and Stitcher and pretty much anywhere, but and on thinkcanbethoughts.com, which is my personal blog. But yeah, there's nine episodes right now. Such a fascinating subject and one of the more fascinating history within any form of cannabis history presentations that I've ever seen um, or heard. Thank Just you. Just really uh, amazing stuff. And yeah, you know, I used to like hate history growing up, but 
reading this and understanding this and really you know, creating this podcast has made me love history. It's kind of an odd, an odd experience that I've had with it all. Yeah, no, indeed. I mean, it's a fascinating history. And for the listeners who don't know, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics was the original incarnation of the Drug Enforcement Administration. So the SBN mm-hmm. turned into the DEA. <laughs> right. And just really great. To understand who we are, to understand our psychology as a people, as a nation, as a civilization. And then yet more information and more advocacy work, as if your advocacy work with all of these other organizations wasn't enough, and I don't know how you do it. You also have Friends of Hemp. Can you tell us a little bit about what Friends of Hemp is? Yeah, so Friends of Hemp was created like late 2015, early 2016, and really because we needed a nonprofit to help with some educational movement that we were doing. So we started doing a lot of uh, hemp foods cook-offs and hemp tap takeovers and just getting chefs in the community to start understanding how to incorporate hemp into their diets and into their everyday routines. So it started out as that. We continue to do those events now. But more recently, we have brought on the Hemp Feed Coalition, which is a program now of Friends of Hemp. And it's a group of industry stakeholders who are working with manufacturers to try to get hemp approved as an animal feed. So it's a really important movement. It's actually pretty bizarre that this is the oldest crop on earth, but yet one of them, but yet we don't have all of this research that proves or past marketability that proves that hemp was used within animal feeds or or certain products prior to when certain regulations went in, into play. So we actually have to do all of these clinical trials for dogs and cats and horses and different production animals like cattle and and pigs and chickens so that we can prove that this that these products are actually safe for animal consumption and that they're safe and particularly when the animal consumes it and then when we consume that animal so we have to go through this really deep dive into making sure that that the products are safe and it's pretty weird to think about because Uh, I was reading some information the other day about cattle feed and a cow can actually up to 3% of its diet can be candy. And yet we're sitting here trying to prove that hemp is actually safe for a cow to consume. So it could be candy. You just said candy with how a C. insane that is. Did you, <laughs> did you just say, did you say candy with a C? Candy with a C. Like Mars, yeah, so for instance, it, they will... They're, they're like byproducts of manufacturing. They, they want to do something with it, right? So I guess, you know, a decade ago or so, they decided, oh, let's just throw it into the cattle market. So they'll sell that to manufacturers who then grind it down and, uh, and mix it up with other feeds. And then they'll feed that into the cattle market. So it'll be like Indeed. sprinkles it, and Snickers and, you know, old food, essentially. Indeed. <laughs> no, animal feed. Animal feed and pet feed is a is a highly exploitive market. And when we had the mad cow disease scare, that's when things really started to change in ag feed. But getting back to the Hemp Feed Coalition and hemp specifically, even though, of course, we know that it is much healthier for the animals and will produce a healthier result, both with omega-3s, with protein and all of the various functions of the systems, animal systems that depend on EFAs for optimal functioning. Not a single ingredient for a single species has been approved in, in even North America. And is it right that the FDA requires a application for each ingredient for each species? So hemp seed is one ingredient. Hemp seed, hulled hemp seeds is one ingredient. Hemp seed oil is another mm-hmm. ingredient. Hemp extract would be another ingredient. But so a a separate application for each ingredient and each species, other than, of course, dogs and cats. So I guess they give us that freebie because we don't consume dogs and cats per se in this country. Is Mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah, that's right. We might be able to add certain ingredients on to other ingredients. It just depends on what the moisture is and what the initial uh, nutritional analysis and toxicological reports provide. But as long as they're within like the same realm of nutrition and moisture, uh, the FDA, Center for Veterinary and Medicine, may allow us to combine those products. However, when we initially approached them, it was each ingredient 
per animal. So we're looking, you know, at like seven different species, seven to eight different species and probably about eight different ingredients. So it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money to, to get these, to get just hemp approved as an animal feed. Um, but, you know, it's so important and, for for the farmer and for the processors. There's a ton of byproduct right now that's just essentially being wasted and we can easily use that within, within animal feed markets and create healthier animals and you are what your food eats. Being a co-owner of a hemp grain processing facility, you know, I'm acutely, if not painfully aware of, we call it co-products, sis. There ain't no such thing as a byproduct in hemp. They're all (laughs) co-products. So, so yes, you know, painfully aware of seed cake piling up as, as we can't keep up with the hemp seed oil orders, but the seed cake, which is the co-product, which is you know, milled into protein powders or coarse ground meal or have flowers and certainly used for ag feed is really piling up. So we really need to open up those agricultural markets for our farmers and for our processors for an obviously healthy ingredient to add and incorporate into uh, animal diets. And isn't it true that the bioaccumulation of THC within these species is sort of the big question mark that the FDA and other departments of ag and departments of health are wanting to look at bioaccumulation of THC. Is that sort of the big issue? I would say that's part of it. I think it's also, you know, do the animals eat it? Do they want to eat it? And then how is it going to impact, for instance, ruminant animals versus non-ruminant animals? So they, they just don't really know how and then how that those omegas might carry over and there's just a lot of unknowns. However, I I think you could pretty easily understand how the omegas might carry just by looking at flax or or other uh, grain products that are similar in in the omega profile as hemp is. So I I would say that the cannabinoids in general, maybe not necessarily just THC, but uh, the whole spectrum of cannabinoids is probably a, a concern not necessarily because the other cannabinoids are intoxicating because they're not, but just knowing, well, how much is going to be in it when the cow, you know, gives milk or, or when you eat the cow and, and then are, how much of that is accumulating in you? Uh, because that obviously will, will impact the health of, of humanity, probably for the better, but that's just my opinion, <laughs> but we'll see what the science says. Indeed. No. And I know in the Washington State Department of Agriculture, I used to live in Washington State, uh, was tasked with doing a, a, a study of hemp as ag feed for the laying hen. That was mm-hmm. their major thing in the end was, boy, we just we were concerned about a consumer uh, appearance that if you buy your eggs from Washington, that you're going to get high off them if we start feeding them hemp. <laughs> and by the way, Washington Department of Ag is far more sophisticated than, you know, than that truncated comment I just made. It just said, you know, it's a consumer issue. It's a safety issue. It just seemed like, again, it's this social engineering that we are all still dealing with um, now is, right. is still raises its head, even in ag feed. And Miss Annie, if people want to donate to the Hemp Feed Coalition, which is doing the, some of the most important work right now in the country and for the farmer, where could they go to to donate? Yeah, you can go to friendsofhemp.org and there are uh, different tabs in which you um, can be prompted to donate. Right now, we actually got our PayPal account shut off because we're dealing with hemp, but we are looking for alternatives to be able to donate online in in a simplified manner. So ideally, we'll have those set up, but our address is on the page and you can send a check uh, to that address and we... and you know, your donations are warmly accepted. Checks and money orders. Excellent. Well, Miss Annie Rouse, just hemp baron and hemp goddess of epic proportions of a Navi market, of (laughs) Friends of Hemp, of your incredible podcast and of all the nonprofits you serve. And as president of the HIA, thank you for your service on the HIA board. We're so grateful to have you today and, and for your time and for everything that you do for hemp. And I hope that we get to have you on again. Oh, I hope you'll have me back again. And, and thank you for all of your hard work in the industry. My honor, my pleasure always, sister. Thank you so much, Miss Annie. Until next time. Tell me, boy, you make me 
so bored You need to walk the other way I tell you once more Hi, my name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.